Good morning, everyone. Can we get that a little better? Good morning, everyone. There we go. Thank you. That's the joke for the day. Um, no, uh, I, I'm Jesse Kennecke from Cornell University Library, and I want to welcome you all to WolfCon 2023. And we're going to start off the day with a, um, some thank yous for uh, WolfCon 2023. We are um, going to give some uh, information about how things are going to work here, um, some of which you'll need to ask again later, probably because it'll be right on the side. But take your pictures as you go. Um, and uh, then lead into... Um, some folks from the University of Chicago are going to talk about our host institution and city here. And um, let's get going. Uh, first of all, we want to thank sponsors. Uh, sponsors really made things happen with money and equipment and people, and uh, uh, we couldn't have done it without them. Um, and uh, as you see folks from these uh, organizations, uh, please thank them. A few of them will have tables set up out in the, the entrance way back here. Um, feel free to uh, stop by and talk to them and uh, uh, both learn from them and teach them about our uh, open source software community that we got here. Uh, thank you to our sponsors. Um, uh, uh, EBSCO is a uh, is our platinum sponsor, University of Chicago, our platinum local host sponsor. Um, they both uh, pulled a lot of uh, effort and funding for the for this. Um, RLF, the academic research libraries exchange in on folio. <laughs> I was busy setting up slides up there instead of practicing. So, um, at Cult, um, ex Libris, um, at a at a nice, uh, generous level of support for us, um, and Index Data, MeScan, and Knowledge Integration as well, uh, rounding out our um, our sponsor supporters here. Thank you all very much. Uh, can we give a hand a hand? And uh, I'm not going to name everyone here because I am probably already over time for my section. Uh, but uh, many, many hands go into making uh, a, a conference like this possible. And I really want to thank each and everyone here, all the people we missed that um, contributed, uh, and we just didn't have their name in the right place at the right time uh, to get them there. But uh, thanks, um, particularly to our local uh, local team here at the University of Chicago that um, have made it possible for us to all be here. Thank you all, uh, volunteers. Um, at WolfCon, we have 638 registered attendees. That includes uh, the 190 approximately that may be in this room right now. Um, and almost 450 virtual attendees. I believe that is our highest uh, combined total, um, I assume, at this point. Um, so we are a growing uh, organization and conference. So thank you all for being here, uh, representing uh, six continents, right? Um, so we need an institution in Antarctica to uh, do Folio or some other open source uh, library software project. and get them on board. Uh, and that's where we can have WolfCon sometime. Uh, speaking of that, um, particularly, uh, we're looking for an institution outside the US, I believe. Um, and we may be talking to many of you uh, to uh, put on a WolfCon for next year. And um, uh, we'll have a lot of conversations throughout these few days with many of you. Um, but yeah, this, uh, this is an amazing spread of people from around the world here. Um, and uh, Australia and New Zealand may be our newest continent added to attendance, but I'm not completely sure. And I don't know if we have people in person from each and every one of these continents, but it's pretty good. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Steph. Excellent. Big green button. 
Good morning, everyone. My name is Stephanie Buck. I am the Senior Operations Officer for the Open Library Foundation, and I also am a product owner with Folio. I am thrilled to see you all here. We're going to use WolfCon 23 for our social media. Also, <laughs> Rachel and Wolfie. <laughs> Thanks, Steph. I'm Rachel Fadlon. Um, I'm from EBSCO, but I also do outreach and marketing for the Open Library Foundation and for Folio. Um, and I get the fun part of bringing <laughs> mascot Wolfie, Wolfie, my favorite part, wearing a Chicago style dog shirt in case any of you can't see that. I wanted to make sure everyone saw that. Um, so I just wanna make sure that everyone remembers that we do have a Wolfie selfie contest. Some of you may be familiar with it. For those of you whose first time this is, a Wolfie selfie contest is where you get to come. Wolfie will be hanging out at the reception table uh, wearing his cool clothing and you can take him and take a creative selfie with him. Um, if you wanna be part of the contest, then you need to post that on, I'm gonna call it what was formerly known as Twitter. Um, that is where we are still on social media for now. Uh, we'll be discussing that for the future for the Open Library Foundation, but because we have such a large number of users on there now, that's where we're gonna stay for this WolfCon. So take some fun selfies of yourself with Wolfie. If you wanna be part of the contest, please use the hashtag, is it up there? Yes, WolfCon23. Um, we'll be going through those and we'll be announcing the winner of the Wolfie selfie on Thursday morning. All right, so we are following, as we did last year, Folio's Code of Conduct. Thank you, Folio. Um, it is hyperlinked here. You can find it on the wiki. Um, and just a couple of things that we like to remind everyone, we always try to assume positive intent. Um, we're trying to respect everyone's time here in the building and everyone on Zoom. So we would like to try to start and end when we're supposed to. We'll see how that goes. And then uh, we really just want this to be a great experience for everyone on site and joining us through Zoom. Uh, so let's let's try to be the kind people I know we all are. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Tom. Good morning. Uh, my name is Tom Kramer. I am the president of the Open Library Foundation. I'm also the associate uh, associate university librarian uh, at Stanford University in charge of IT. And with my colleagues, Alexis Mannheim and Yale Hode, we're excited to be here because right now we are cutting over to Folio back home. Um, Wish us all luck, and by Thursday or Friday, depending if we're smiling or not, you'll know how it's going. So everyone at home, keep up the good work. Um, let's see. Okay, great. Uh, I'm here just to give a few words of, of orientation on where we are with the Open Library Foundation and the projects within our community of communities, and also a few words about what might be coming next. So... Um, uh, WolfCon is a tremendously clever name. I did not come up with it, unlike Arliff, which sadly I did have a hand in, but there was a social process. And thank you, Jesse, for drawing that out. Um, uh, but the OLF in WolfCon stands for the Open Library Foundation. And we are here to foster, connect, and support open source communities and open source projects that serve libraries. As a foundation, we provide that fiscal steward and that organizational home for often these organic or emergent initiatives that are great collaborations but need that solid foundation. Um, so in terms of providing things like communication and outreach, uh, legal and financial services, uh, advocacy for open source, uh, incubation for up and coming projects, uh, that is what the foundation does. Our theory is that libraries plus open source makes for a great combination. So a chocolate and peanut butter resulting in better service, more innovation, more collaboration, increased capacity, and perhaps most importantly, self-determination. By working together, we can pick the future and build the future that we would like to build. There are uh, six OLF related projects. And if you look at this slide compared to last year's slide, there are two big, exciting new additions. So in addition to our stalwarts of ARC or uh, the Advanced Research Consortium, Folio, GoKB, and ViewFind, 
this year, we are pleased to present and debut OpenRS, uh, which is what the Open Research Shoring Sharing Coalition, uh, I believe, hot off the presses. There will be an announcement and a press release going out today. If you are part of OpenRS, could you please raise your hand or stand up? Thank you very much. So if you are interested in learning more Uh, about direct consortial borrowing and borrowing en masse uh, uh, across more than a library, but perhaps uh, more focused than interlibrary loan, you know who to talk to. It's very exciting to see this development. It's a wonderful compliment to uh, Folio, Viewfind, uh, GoKB, and the other library platforms that we have within the, the foundation. I'm also pleased that the library data platform, which has been incubating or LDP uh, for the last year is taking bold steps. If you are here from LDP, could you please raise your hand? I saw Mike earlier. Okay, I see Mike down here in front. I'm sure that Mike would be very pleased Yeah, no, he's smiling. He would be pleased to talk to you. <laughs> as are several other institutions which are really helping and hoping uh, LDP to spin up into a full venture. Um, just as a reminder, the, the Open Library Foundation has a board and officers. It is an all volunteer foundation. Uh, you can see uh, the list of foundation board members and uh, officers on this page. I won't read them off. I will say special thank you to Paula Solinger and to Chris Keene both of whom have just achieved the, their final terms. We have an election going on and a nominations process going on underway right now to fill their two seats. If you are interested or if you know someone who would be a fantastic board member and contributor to the group, uh, please don't be shy and uh, come up to talk to me or anyone that's uh, pictured on one of these slides. I'd also like to do a special shout out to Beth German. Um, Beth started at Texas A&M, where she helped organize the last conference pre-COVID for many of us. Um, she has since transitioned to Princeton, which is not a user of any of the products within the foundation's portfolio, but her commitment and her organizational capacity and her contributions have been tremendous. Uh, Beth is just entering a PhD program and will be stepping away from the foundation. She wasn't able to make it here today, but she was instrumental in helping organize this event. So I would just, Beth, if you're out there, uh, maybe people could just give a small round of applause. Um, so that's where the foundation is today, just a quick snapshot, and I want to spend a little bit of time looking forward into some of the areas where I think our work as a community of communities may be particularly important. And these are areas that we are focused on, particularly at Stanford, uh, and that we see developing, but we think are uh, broader and US-wide and also international. In some areas, the U.S., uh, well, I don't need to tell those of you who are from overseas, but in some areas, the U.S. is just catching up. Uh, we have some examples here. Um, so if you are aware of the Nelson Memorandum, or if you know what OSTP is, you might be ahead of the game, but this is the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. It, almost a year ago this week, a uh, memorandum was released, and this is bringing the United States into the same realm uh, that Europe has been for much of the last seven to 10 years. Um, the, these will be a new set of mandates that will affect every federally funded research project uh, that is out there, not just the top 10, not just the with $100 million in funding for more, but literally the scores or hundreds of U.S. funding agencies, big and small. The mandates will be rolling out between 2025 and 2027, and the motivations are all, um, uh, all seem very admirable and notable and should resonate with those in this crowd. So it's things like equitable access, um, uh, rapid sharing of results, uh, um, boy, my uh, my eyesight is not what it was. Uh, so I'm going to read. You can read those better than I can, probably. It sucks getting old. Um, looking forward, the uh, implications are tremendous for uh, U.S. scientific enterprise, for U.S. research enterprise, and for all of the industries around these. 
So for publications, all publications must be made openly available immediately upon publication with no one to two year embargo. This is a sea change. All research data supporting publications must similarly be made available. Uh, this means that researchers can't just uh, say the data will be available upon request. They can't just say, well, don't look at the data because really the important thing is the article. Uh, data is now a first class research output and is going, I think, to require the skills and uh, functions that a library has often presented in other areas of the research enterprise. Uh, warming any uh, librarian's heart, metadata is specifically called out. M yes, believe it or not, metadata is in a federal memo. Uh, it must be also be made freely and openly available both to humans and to machines at the point of publication. And then finally, persistent identifiers will be a requirement for all, um, all entities. So researchers, organizations, uh, funding grants, and I think we can also see things like instrumentation or shared facilities. Um, how are researchers going to be able to accomplish all of this in the next three to five years? Well, it's going to take a lot of work, and I am pretty sure that libraries will be integral to this. Many of us have been uh, waiting for this or anticipating this since the 2013 Holdren Memo, um, and the penny is finally dropping. Now is the time, I think, for us as a community to focus on the skills, the services, and the expertise that we can bring to this environment as the agencies are beginning to set policies and as they will go into force. Uh, this is a wonderful chance to define and to bring about a brighter future. Uh, one of the other examples or one of the other major trends that I see developing is open science. And this is an area where, again, I think Europe at least has been uh, several years ahead of the United States. One of the specific calls, uh, this is the year of open science in the United States. Uh, NASA is running the TOPS program. It's towards open, uh, towards open science, a little p. Uh, they are spending $40 million over five years. There are 20 agencies that have signed on to support the push towards open science, which recognizes that scholarly communications uh, is a longstanding and essential function for doing research. Um, but it also recognizes that with digital technology and a worldwide network, the way science can be done and the way science needs to be done is now changing. It has multiple fundamental drivers. Part of those is uh, open access to the scholarly outputs or the research outputs of science. So that's not only publications, but also data, also methodology, even instruments. It is also looking for more rigorous and reproducible science. So your, your raw data and your methodology can be shared so they can be reproduced and built on. It's also looking at producing more equitable and inclusive science. So it's not only those with the best equipment or the best data, but the best ideas are able to participate in advancing the benefit to society and to humanity. And it recognizes that if you're no longer so focused on the scholarly outputs and impact factor in scholarly journals, how do we actually assess science and who's doing the most uh, to help contribute to that? I believe once again, all of these things, if you're looking at this, libraries have a fundamental and a critical role to play. And then finally, uh, this is very exciting, uh, but I think uh, it, it's been 25 years coming or it's been 25 years that linked data is always three to five years away. Well, I think we're, we're that much closer. Uh, let me say it that way. Um, so BibFrame and the cloud of data, I think uh, you are going to hear some wonderful uh, keynote presentations from the Library of Congress. For those of us that have been involved in BibFrame and linked data, this is a sea change in how bibliographic description, how metadata works. Every single library function essentially and every single library service is powered by metadata. This is baked into how we do things. We are doing the same uh, approaches to metadata that we have been since the 1960s and 1970s. Linked data will change that. You will hear from Caitlin Stewart. Uh, Gloria Gonzalez will be leading a panel uh, on the LC's implementation. This is going to be a very exciting change. Imagine what we can do together if we can stop copying each other's metadata and actually start enriching common pools of metadata for richer and better services. So, how are these three advances or advances on these three fronts going to come about? And there's lots of different actors. There's lots of different interests. Uh, there's uh, governmental interests. There's commercial interests. There's library interests. There's researcher interests that are all going to come together. 
this is, I think, the beauty of a foundation like the Open Library Foundation and our open source projects. We, all of us who are gathered in this room, all of those sectors who are represented can realize these future potentials through collaboration, through good structure, and by recognizing and applying the best methods and principles of open source software development. So that is why I think we are all here, and that is what I'm very much looking forward to hearing and being part of the next couple of days. So thank you very much. And with that, I will turn things over to a welcome from our host with Torsten Reimer, who is the university librarian and the director at the uh, University of Chicago. Well, thank you for the introduction and thanks for all of you who are here in the room today or here online. One of the great things about running university library is that I'm often sort of dropped into events and I'm being asked to say a few nice words and say, oh, everyone who's coming to the event is terrific and we who are hosting it are terrific and then by extension, I'm also terrific. Um, and this is not what I'm going to do today. Um, there's sort of a few standard things one, one is going to do, but I'll, I'll drop, I think, all of those. Uh, and instead give maybe a slightly post-apocalyptic view on what Tom's just described. Um, and that is because I'm angry and I think we should all be angry. And give me a brief moment to explain why I'm angry and I promise I'll bring it back to why you're here today. Um, I moved to the United States almost now a year and a half ago. And coming here, I realized that um, the US is not alone in this. I moved into a slightly divided country that let's just say wherever you stand politically has its challenges. What I didn't expect though is that relatively soon after coming here I would have to read about books being banned in libraries. I would have to hear about librarians being threatened for not wanting books to be banned or hear about librarians being fired from their job. I just read yesterday about a, a local librarian in the state not too far away from here to the West who lost her job because, after 20 years because she was unwilling to ban certain books from her library. And I'm also hearing from colleagues at other states that um, there are certain words that if they write them into an email and send them to me, diversity, for example, is one of them, uh, that that triggers an alarm on an email filter and that they could potentially risk losing their job and that ultimately if they engage in these things their libraries could risk being pulled out of library associations and, and groups um, and could perhaps even be threatened with being shut down. I think that's reason for everyone to be angry irrespective I would think or hope where you stand because at least certainly in this university, we believe that freedom of speech and freedom of inquiry are two essential things that make not just research, but the world a better place. But I think this is also linked in some quite specific ways to what you're doing here today and what as a community we are doing, which is part of the reason that we are in this mess, I think, currently is that um, through social media that I was very excited about when it came up, we have to a degree, I think, lost the ability to have an open and engaged debate, which social media was all meant to be about, and have instead become much more tribalized. And part of the reasons why this has happened is because the algorithms of some of these platforms are designed to create attention and to uh, attention and clicks and anger creating money for the platform. And that's now, I think, the part where I'm sort of switching over into the library world. I think for years now in libraries, we fought for making things more open, and I think that's the right thing to do. And a lot of that effort has been opening up content. And the idea was, I think, well, um, if we just open up all the content and it lives out on the web, and ideally, if it has nice metadata and is linked, then that will all feed into this open scholarly and societal discourse. And that knowledge um, that the uh, people who we serve and also some of us share will help make this a better world. And I mean, it does arguably, and in some cases, I think it's failed to do that. And a lot of this, I think, has to do with um, making content open by itself is not good enough if the infrastructures through which the content is mediated are not open. 
And I'm increasingly concerned that as we believe that we've won the battle, and we could have a good long discussion about whether transformative agreements are winning the battle for open or not. But as we are sort of increasingly making more scholarly content open, that we've won the battle. And I think we may have certainly won some battles, but we are in danger of losing the war because increasingly universities, academics, all of us, we rely on an increasingly smaller number of commercial entities who at the moment mostly point us to what their algorithm feels is the most useful thing for us to see. But if you now look at the most recent developments in AI, Ultimately, they will not just point us to the source directly, they'll just give us their best summary of that source and they will start making, in effect, they're already making recommendations on what we should do. And that happens in every life. It happens about which uh, route you should take when you cycle or drive somewhere. But it's increasingly also, I think, going to happen in the research space where the great set of tools and you can buy them sometimes from the same company and they're nicely integrated so you can use the tools to track publications to license publications to put your open content into tools by the same company and your faculty can use those tools to track their publications and your provosts or others in the organizations that you work with are using these tools to ultimately shape a strategy for the organization so we are i think on the path to a journey where while the content will all be open, there will be systems that ultimately will tell provosts, you need to invest in this kind of research. And they will tell faculty, if you want to increase your impact factor, your age index, your citations, whatever you care, you should think about publishing with this person on this particular topic, because if we bring your readerships together, then um, you will increase your um, citation count. I mean, this is all in the works and some of it, we would probably find useful. But the big challenge is if all of this is controlled, not per se by commercial algorithms, I don't want to say that using commercial bits of infrastructure is bad, but if this is all closed by uh, controlled by closed algorithms that we don't understand, then we lose what ultimately I think is at the heart of research, which is it needs to be reproducible and transparent. And then we lose what's at the heart of librarianship, because be, being able to tell our patrons, um, if you use our tools in the broadest sense possible, all the knowledge out there, this is what you can find, this is what it's not so good at, this is how the search is going to be structured. And I increasingly don't understand how these tools work. I'm not quite sure how many of us really understand of how some of these algorithms work. And give it five or 10 more years of the current developments in AI and related technologies that we are seeing, and even now, I think we are sometimes at the point where even some of the engineers who develop this cannot exactly tell you how it works because they might have written part of the code, but someone else has trained it on a data set and something comes out that will be surprised and confused that engineer. So we are, I think, essentially at the point now that we might win the battle for open content, but we risk losing um, the battle for true open access and transparent access. And that's bad for libraries and it's bad for societies overall, because you can already see what mess we are in having lost the ability to have a civilized discussion across different political, I mean, as a historian, maybe that never existed, but um, let's just assume for a moment that we would have had the potential to build it. And we've partly, I think, lost that chance. And we're now also losing the chance of having clear, transparent, reproducible research being filtered into these political debates and the hope that they'll make a difference. So that's why I'm angry and frustrated and very concerned. And that's why I didn't want to stand here and say we're all great because despite some good efforts, I think we have in some ways failed uh, and we need to do a lot more. And what I want to leave you with is um, not a sort of friendly invitation, but a really sort of stern face uh, that can say, if as a community we don't get better to strengthen our governance, to put resources in, to find ways of working with the commercial entities who want to work on open models, that we jointly define where the journey is going and that we resource all of this properly, um, then we are not going to serve our users and we'll ultimately fail society. So this is really my plea to all of us. Let's make this thing work, because if we don't make it work, the impact is really going to be unpleasant. 
so that's really what I have to say as uh, as my not quite normal welcoming talk, but I thought this is the community that hopefully understands what I'm trying to say. Um, thankfully, though, there will be uh, a second part to the host welcome, for which I'm going to hand over to my colleague Rebecca, who might do some of the things that you would normally expect to see. Um, despite all of this, I just want to say I'm really glad that you're here because I know that you're all and also those of you who join us online, you're all doing some work that hopefully will prevent some of this apocalyptic take on what, uh, what Tom's described. Um, and I think it can still be fixed, but it really requires us to work together and clear, transparent, understandable governance to which we can all work together and put our resources into this is the one thing that's going to make this succeed. Let's drop the idea of failure for a moment. And I'd like to invite all of us to just keep working on this. And thank you for being here and thank you all for the effort that you're putting in. And I'm now handing over to Rebecca. Hello, um, my name is Rebecca Starkey. I'm the head of research and instruction services at the University of Chicago Library. I'm a University of Chicago graduate, and um, I'm very happy to be here today. Um, I'm just going to check to see if my slides are available. I got some great pictures for us. Hey, here we go. But um, as that loads, I just want to let you know that I'm here today really to welcome you to the University of Chicago, welcome you to the city, to Hyde Park, and our lovely campus. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about our library and the role that it plays on our campus, which is really the central part of our institution. So let's get it. It's loaded. So I have lots of fun pictures here for you all. <laughs> so welcome. So um, we, we are happy to have you here at the University of Chicago, which was founded in 1890 and is a very um, you know, uh, leading university in the United States and around the world. We are a center for inquiry, freedom of speech, as Torsten mentioned. And likewise, our library, we have a very large academic library. We're the ninth largest in North America. We have all these volumes, things that you are probably aware of as you came to campus today. Um, we have six campus libraries. I hope that you might have time to visit our campus libraries. Um, we have some here on the south side of the Midway, but also our Regenstein and Mansueto libraries, which are located um, just through the quad on the other side of campus. And we also have a library that's not a library. Um, it's our old library, the Harper Memorial Library, which is now the Kathy Learning Center on campus, which is just beautiful and does have that grand reading room that you might expect from a storied institution um, like you, Chicago. But um, really, uh, oh, in our collections, we have beautiful collections, um, and that's what you all help us provide access to our students using our you find and folio to access our amazing collections that are available um, online in print in our special collections and it really your work makes this all possible for our community but with this i'd like to share a little bit more um, because i feel you know the library is a wonderful spot but it does hold a unique place in the university of chicago um, psyche, <laughs> and also um, there's a real sense of devotion and centrality to our library on campus. And I'm just going to give a little background about how this happened. And it all began with a World's Fair. So the 1893 World's Columbian Expedition opened right about when the University of Chicago did. The university opened in 1890. Um, the fair was in 1893, and it was located right here by the Midway here on campus. And uh, the university was central to that. Um, so people came from around the world to explore not only the wonderful sites of the um, World's Fair, but also our burgeoning university. And this is the world's largest and first uh, Ferris wheel, which was located just around the corner on the Midway. So because of this landmark space and everyone knew about the Midway as the World's Fair, um, this also connects it to our 
football team. <laughs> so we were the first original monsters of the Midway, not the Chicago Bears. The University of Chicago Maroons were the monsters of the Midway. We had a huge football team, and many people might not associate the University of Chicago with Big Ten football, but yes, we were stalwarts of the Big Ten. Our famous coach, Alonzo Stagg, led us to victory many years. We were a huge football school, and we had the first Heisman Trophy winner, Jay Berwanger. You can see the Heisman Trophy over in our athletic center, and then, um, you know, students and Chicagoans came to see the Monsters of the Midway um, here and play football in the famous Stag Field, which was on uh, the in the main campus. And we were this huge football institution. Um, that was until Robert Maynard Hutchins. Robert Maynard Hutchins. <laughs> was a powerful president of the university who enacted lots of changes to the university and the curriculum, but he also um, it was an advocate of the great books method of teaching, which still influences the um, University of Chicago curriculum today. But he did not like sports. And well, let's just say, or more specifically, sports influence in higher education. And he sort of let the football team just wither away on the vine during the start of his term. And then eventually, in 1939, he abolished football at the university. So our stag field, famous stag field, remained empty and was not utilized except for this um, thing that came along called the Manhattan Project. <laughs> so under the stag football field, there was some squash courts, and that was where the first self-sustained nuclear reaction took place. Um, so not surprisingly, this became actually more famous than UChicago football over time, because this is where this um, famous event took place. So over time, stag full, uh, football field, its gates, its, its turrets were torn down, the field became underutilized. Um, and when the university was looking for a place to build a new library, well, why don't we build it on the football field? <laughs> So the Regenstein Library, our, our library today, became the new symbol of the university on the football field. We became famous for the library or the university that tore down its football field for a library. And that was really <laughs> central <laughs> to our campus. So with no student union and no division one sports, the university became known for its academic rigor, and Regenstein embodied the Chicago philosophy of the life of the mind. Serious students studied at the reg. For... And we were known for serious students. For many years, we were known for having very serious students. In fact, the highlight for many years of the social season at the University of Chicago was when students slept out to pick which classes they took each year. This was before the internet, of course, um, but they would stand in line and sleep out for classes. So it was kind of not a social university, let's just say. Um, in fact, some st <laughs> students would sell t-shirts that University of Chicago was where fun came to die. Um, this was very popular. It was a good fundraising effort for one of the dorms, and boy, they made the money on the t-shirts. Uh, so um, we had this very serious reputation, and I think we still have that. And, you know, the Regenstein kind of matches this with the, the brutalist architecture. Um, and it became really a central spot on campus. But um, thankfully, over time, I think the library and the university have gotten a lot less gray, a lot less brutal and harsh and concrete. In fact, Today, over the last two decades, the university has really transformed and the library has with it. And um, it is not just the technological changes and the things that have made um, using the library more broad, but also just culturally here on campus. We have a really different university. Um, we had a very small undergraduate population for years in the last um, 10 or 
15 years, the undergraduate population has grown and that's changed the characteristics of the campus. We have new programs like the Veteran Scholars and QuestBridge and Collegiate Scholars that have made our community more diverse than ever. Um, University of Chicago undergraduates aren't just serious and want to study anymore. They are socially engaged. They are interested in how they can learn and explore different topics. They engage in research and they want to make an impact on the world. And our graduate population has also grown and our changes and more focus on STEM and interdisciplinary research, all of this, which I'm sure you'll be talking about in terms of res open research this week. But um, it is really, truly an exciting time to be at the University of Chicago, so I'm glad you're here. And um, with these changes, the library remains really the center of student life here. Um, unlike other campuses where students do not come into the library as much as they can access resources from anywhere, um, our gate counts continue to rise, especially with undergraduates. And for our students, the library is not merely a place to work, but a place to be seen and be see and be seen. It is where students go to socialize, study, collaborate, and hang out. And we have lots of spaces for them to do this. We have a very popular first floor that is packed with and has a student run cafe called Ex Libris, which is extremely popular. We have a collaborative study area where our economics students hang out. We have a lot of econ students who do their problem sets. We have our beautiful Joe Ma Rico Mansueta Library, which has a glorious, beautiful, modern take on this classic reading room and an underground robots which I think some of you may be seeing. <laughs> and it's a really draw for students for quiet study and a modern feel. And then of course we have science libraries and our other campus libraries where students work, learn, collaborate and do you know, program with their comp sci classes or work with GIS. So there's lots of different spaces and the library is really central. And we try to make this also a place for students to feel welcome. Um, the library hopes hosts event to make sure that our diverse community of students feel welcomed and that they belong in the library. And um, I have just some pictures of some events that we've done in our various spaces that, and you'll see many of our staff working with our students throughout the Regenstein Library and highlighting not just the beautiful study spaces, but also these collections that students can utilize, the services that are essential, like interlibrary loan, reserves, our scans, scanning service, and most importantly, our librarians who can help guide them. So we also just try to make it a little fun and to also help students relax and feel like the campus is not as brutal as they might think, and it's a little bit more fun. We give them study breaks, we give them time to reflect, relax, and be part of a community. And we show that we care about them. And they show that they care about us. <laughs> and how do we know this? Well, by their Halloween costumes. <laughs> Every year, somebody dresses up as the rag and they send pictures and it's wonderful to see them so excited. We also have been part of the university's famous scavenger hunt. If you have not heard about the scavenger hunt or scav as it's called, it is a weekend, usually Mother's Day weekend, um, where students will do an ex insane scavenger hunt. Um, they have to get people from around the world and they do all these exciting things. And one year they did their own Miss Regenstein contest where students dressed up like their favorite floor and study space. Um, we also had uh, some other events where they build their own Mansueta library here out of garbage bags, um, but we usually are part in some way of the scavenger hunt because of the library's importance um, to the student life. And then finally, this came to me last week <laughs> on Instagram, and their affection <laughs> is very permanent. <laughs> this is a tattoo of the Joseph Regenstein Library that someone uh, just got. Um, we're very impressed by the artwork. 
Uh, but this is, if there's nothing that shows how important the library is to our students, is um, someone had a permanent rep reproduction um, for them to have the rest of their lives. So I would like to uh, welcome you and um, let you know that where that fun comes to die t-shirt is not popular or sold anymore on campus, but it does live in our university archives. And we do drag it out every Halloween for our study breaks, appropriately with our skeleton that we also have in the archives. And um, so I'm happy and pleased at both as an alum and a librarian and part of this community that um, there is much joy at the University of Chicago. And I hope you also get to experience it. And I'd also just like to re Reform, reaffirm that we do have football still at the University of Chicago. <laughs> we have a successful Division Three team, and also we still have a stag field on campus. So go Maroons. Uh, we're not not perhaps in the Big Ten anymore, but we still have um, we still celebrate sports and health health, and we're happy to have our stag field still. So. Um, I'd like to welcome you, and I hope that you do get to visit our libraries, and I hope you have a great time at WolfCon. Um, this is our informal mascot, um, Hutch the Squirrel, <laughs> so um, named after Hutchins, <laughs> the person who um, changed our football plans. So uh, we are like happy that Hutchins, uh, Hutch is the squirrel, is around the library to welcome, and um, welcome to Wolfie as well, your mascot to our campus. So. Thank you all for learning a little bit about the University of Chicago. I hope those of you who are remote got a taste of what it's like to be on campus and learn a little bit about Chicago and um, enjoy your time here. Enjoy your meetings. Thank you. Today, I'd like to introduce Caitlin Stewart, um, the project lead for Library Collections Access Platform Project uh, with the Library of Congress. And I'm sure, like me, many of you are excited about the Library of Congress getting involved in the Folio Project. And um, there should be a lot of exciting things on the horizon. And Caitlin's going to talk about uh, scaling to serve and the Library of Congress and Folio. And actually, the first thing I'm going to do is make sure you can hear me. Okay, great. Um, so, one minute. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, this is a great opportunity for us to connect with our community here of other folio libraries. And I got to say, it's been a big year for the Library of Congress. Um, it's been just about a year since we announced our plans to implement folio. And in doing so, we also committed to releasing any of the enhancements needed for our implementation back to all of you as part of the community build. Since then, we've been hard at work with our partners at EBSCO, configuring a test instance, holding workshops, shadowing staff, testing, all to explore how we might be able to leverage the work that's already going on in the community to better meet our needs. As we go, we've also been identifying those areas where we can create new features to meet our needs while benef benefiting the community as a whole. I'm proud to say that work is nearing its end. Uh, we now have a sizable backlog and a much clearer picture of where that development needs to happen. We also have a better sense of where, thanks to the hard work of all the people in this room, Folio has the existing functionality that can be configured to meet our needs. Over this time, we've also been building up our team, many of whom are here today, uh, which we're really lucky to have everyone here. Uh, and as of last month, uh, we officially joined as members of the Folio community. So I hope today's presentation can serve as a bit of an introduction to LC and our plans to implement Folio, but also serve as a kickoff to our more active participation in this community. So it strikes me that this is a pretty good opportunity for us to introduce ourselves or reintroduce ourselves to some of you. A lot of people know us as the largest library in the world, although when it comes to sheer number of records, I think some of the consortia in this community have us beat. 
Uh, I think that part of what makes us so mm -hmm. special is not just the scale, but the diversity of our collections. Uh, if you look at the slide here, uh, we have 25 million cataloged books. And of that, it's important to note that uh, we have materials in 470 languages and more than half of the library's books and serials are in languages other than English. We have 16 million non-class print items and 13 million items in our special collections, including 4.2 million audio materials, 7.7 .7 million manuscripts, including the papers of the first 23 presidents of the United States. We have eight, or sorry, 5.8 million maps. We have 17.5 million microforms, 1.8 million moving images, 8.2 million uh, items of sheet music, 15.2 million photographs, uh, 864,000 posters, prints, and drawings, and finally, 21 petabytes of digital information or digital content, of which uh, there are 914 million unique files. Um, so even within this collection, um, some of we have some of the largest collections of their kind. We have the largest, the world's largest law library. We have the largest rare book collection in North America, and some of you might know we have the largest flute collection. <laughs> um, I think you can all probably appreciate that implementing software to support the acquisition, description, cataloging, and circulation, uh, not to mention discovery of such a vast and div diverse collection is not without its challenges. And that's why over the years, the library has continually built up its staff and infrastructure to keep up with the needs of the collections. Right now, we have about 3,000 staff, half of which will rely on Folio to do their daily work. We have multiple physical locations over seven countries. In addition to our offices in Capitol Hill, we have two high density remote storage facilities just outside of Washington, DC. We have the National Audiovisual Conservation Center in Culpeper, Virginia, but we also have six international offices in Rio de Janeiro, Cairo, Nairobi, New Delhi, Islamabad, and Jakarta. We have 20 reading rooms where we serve our physical materials. And in 2022, we had about 240,000 charges, which makes sense because the vast majority of our materials, both physical and digital, are only available for on-site use. Uh, we get about 300 to 500,000 searches per day on catalog.lock.gov. And that represents just a small subset of the library's web presence, uh, but it remains our most visited web property. And it's important to note that catalog.lock.gov, I call out specifically because it's one of just, uh, it's one of six OPACs that we currently maintain. So one of the things that makes LC so special in addition to collections and scale is the many roles that it plays. Uh, first and foremost, we are a national library. Fun fact, it, the US actually has three different national libraries, uh, LC, the National Library of Medicine and the Nag National Agricultural Library. Uh, but in that capacity, we have uh, numerous programs and services, like many libraries do, uh, that support the bibliographic infrastructure of the United States in different ways. Uh, you might think of the cataloging and publication program that in which the library works with publishers to create bibliographic records for books that have not yet been published. That's how you get the Library of Congress information on the verse of a title page in your book. Uh, we serve as the maintenance agency for the LC classification system for standards such as MARC and for controlled vocabulary such as LCSH. But you might not realize that there are huge institutions that exist entirely within the bounds of the Library of Congress uh, that are also part of the work we do. And I think probably primary among those is the UA US Copyright Office, uh, which is currently undergoing its own major modernization project. Um, it's out of scope for this particular project, but they will be a major integration target for us since we acquire approximately 20% of our new materials via copyright deposit. There's also the National Library Service for the Blind and Print Disabled, sometimes referred to as NLS. That's a free braille and talking book service for people with disabilities that prevent them from using regular print materials. Um, literally anyone in the country with temporary or permanent low vision, blindness, or physical, perceptual, or reading disability that prevents them from using print materials is eligible. And um, I mean, that's pretty incredible. I think we all know someone who can benefit from that. Um, and I will note that in 2022, NLS circulated more than 22.3 million copies of braille, audio, and large print items. And they are quite excited uh, to implement Folio. 
So moving on down, we are also Congress's library. Um, we do offer congressional loan and we have a dedicated office uh, that works with members of Congress and their staff to allow them to check out books from the library. Uh, but you might not know that there's another larger organization within LC called the, uh, the Congressional Research Service. Uh, in 2022, they responded to more than 481,000 reference re requests, uh, including direct use of congressional research reports, which they create. So both CRS and NLS, which I mentioned above, are essentially uh, like libraries within the library. Um, and we're still working with EBSCO to determine exactly what this will look like, but the assumption is that we're going to get to leverage some of that consortial functionality that is currently on the roadmap. So next, and I struggled with this bullet point a little bit, um, we are your library. Um, uh, the idea I'm trying to get across is that in addition to, or perhaps as part of its role as a national library, the Library of Congress has a mandate to connect with its users by engaging their cultural, intellectual, uh, cultural and intellectual curiosity and creativity. Um, and our user base is broad. That is a very diverse group of people that we're talking about. So in order to better understand our users and meet the needs, the library's current, uh, meet their needs, the library's current strategic plan uh, puts the emphasis on being user-centered, digitally enabled, and data-driven. And I think that implementing Folio is going to enable a lot of that work, uh, maybe even in ways that we don't anticipate yet. So finally, um, given all of this, uh, it's easy to overlook that the library is ultimately a federal agency. Uh, while this aspect of, of the Library of Congress's identity confers the weight and the stability needed to take on bold, impactful projects like this one, uh, it also comes with constraints, and it comes with processes that may, may look a little different from other libraries. For example, our budget comes directly from Congress. It is written into law, <laughs> and it, we receive direct congressional oversight on this project. So in order to really understand LC and understand our involvement here, it's important to understand that our top priority, in addition to everything we're going to talk about today, has to be to deliver on our commitments to Congress. In that case, and in, in this case, uh, that means implementing the Library Collections Access Platform, what we call, we call LCAP, of which Folio um, is going to be a part. Uh, in a way that allows us to migrate away from our legacy infrastructure. Um, so the library can take advantage of all the efficiencies of modern technology. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about LCAP. The vision is fairly simple uh, to provide our... Glad that went over well. <laughs> uh, so we're trying to provide our staff with new efficient, sustainable tools and workflows to manage our collections and to provide researchers with a streamlined experience and new ways to access the library's metadata. So the reality is, of course, much more nuanced. <laughs> uh, we lovingly call this the flying spaghetti monster diagram. And this was uh, created in, I believe, 2017 as part of a larger um, in, uh, enterprise architecture uh, survey. Uh, but it gives a pretty good sense of kind of what we're dealing with right now. Uh, so first of all, aging systems. Our current ILS was implemented in 1999 under threat of Y2K. Uh, in fact, it just had its 24th birthday earlier this month. And both our technology and our expectations about how library systems work have changed a lot during that time. Uh, the second, and I think you kind of see this coming up here, is uh, a patchwork architecture. Over the years, we have implemented numerous additional systems to work with our ILS helper applications, processes, you name it, to try to meet our stakeholders' needs. But what you end up with is an architecture that doesn't necessarily um, fit together in an efficient way. Uh, it has a very high maintenance overhead and it's risky because um, in addition to all the components, which make it very complicated, um, some of these systems are maintained just by a single staff person. Uh, they have different levels of documentation um, and all of that makes this complicated to maintain. It also makes it a difficult knot to untie. And that's, that's part of what we're doing with LCAP is trying to get from this to something more efficient. And with that, so this is our, I'm gonna kind of walk you through the LCAP uh, overarching idea here. 
Um, here we have our, our current OPAC, it's a Voyager ILS. Uh, we have six production database, databases included there and six OPACs, lots of customizations. Uh, we have our Millennium ERMS. Um, that's essentially another OPAC that we use to manage electronic resources. We have, this is a vast simplification of the other slide, um, uh, quite a few helper applications. And we're moving from here to an environment where um, everything's much more distributed, it's hosted. We have a discovery layer that is separate from uh, the back end. Um, and everything's connected from uh, via API, which makes it a lot easier uh, to customize and configure the platform. Also makes it a lot easier to get information in and out of it, which is very important for us. All right, so how do we do this? Um, on the highest level, um, this is about making sure we have the features in Folio to meet our needs. So this is the process we're going through right now with help from EBSCO. We're starting out with requirements analysis, taking the 450 requirements that were mandatory for our core implementation and mapping them to features in UX prod. Next, we're going to go live with what we call an MVP, but is really just the core functionality needed for us to migrate off of our current ILS. Um, after that, we will complete the initial implementation with additional features that will complement that functionality and give us all the mandatory features for our task order. On the other side of this, there's a whole implementation project that we also work with EBSCO on. Uh, we're also doing a lot of work internally that involves not just the configuration of our systems, but process improvement, reevaluation of policy, testing, socializing our staff to the idea of the, the changes that are coming training, and finally fine-tuning that system so that it will, can work with us uh, over time. I'll just briefly say that um, we get a, question, a lot of questions about why, why Folio. And I think that there's a direct link to our digital strategy here. Um, as you can see, it calls out the need to collaborate and work with the larger community. But most important, it specifically says that we have uh, a mandate to work with open source software whenever, whenever possible and weigh heavily the beneficial effects of using open source within a community. So ultimately, to me, this adds up to scaling to serve. Um, we are big, we are complicated. It takes a lot of infrastructure to support the collections and programs that we're responsible for. Um, and uh, we have the ability to leverage those investments that we make in that infrastructure to serve a larger community. And this is not new. Uh, in fact, sorry, the picture before was from uh, 1900, picture, picture of people making um, cards for distribution. Uh, there's a through line here. Um, you can see that in the 1960s, Henry Avram uh, developed machine read the, the MARC cataloging standard, and the library's role as a maintenance agency enables huge leaps in data exchange and integration. Uh, our participation in cooperative cataloging, I think, is also part of this. All the digital preservation programs that we have, whether it's developing software, Bagot, or standards like Premise, participation in the FADGI, um project, uh, Bibframe, and some of the new uh, uh, projects that we have on things like crowdsourcing are also part of this. It's important to note that whether we're talking about standards or software, the library has consistently found ways to make the work that it does support its internal uh, operations, does to support its internal operations available to a larger community. We do this not only to support ourselves and because it's part of our mandate, but because we benefit from that broader adoption of software and standards that we create. Um, so let's talk about how this stacks up to the LC implementation. Um, as I mentioned before, for the past 11 months, we've been working with EBSCO to analyze current and planned folio functionality against the Library of Congress's needs for this implementation. And throughout this progress, a process, we've been tagging features um, that address our highest priority needs. And where no features exist, we're creating new ones. 
So far, we've identified 217 features that we must have in place in order to complete our initial implementation, which has to happen by June of 2025. Of those, about 123 are needed for go live. Um, they'll be concentrated mostly in the Poppy and Quisnalia releases. Only about a third of those features have been th that have been identified as mandatory are new uh, and have been created specifically by the Library of Congress. The, li the, the rest originated elsewhere in the community. And I think that's important to emphasize because while the library is definitely introducing a lot of new features to scale folio, uh, the most significant impact of our participation um, is going to be escalating needs that other libraries have already identified. So I'm gonna run through this quickly because I'm, I'm running quite um, long uh, and I can hit some of this in the panel discussion too, but uh, metadata management is one of the major areas that we're focusing on. Uh, we're working with uh, EBSCO, as you know, to implement a bib frame editor and graph data storage in Folio. Uh, but Mark is not going away. Um, we are also making big investments in improving authorities and cataloging within Folio so that we can continue our MARC workflows alongside the implementation of BibFrame. Data exchange is also incredibly important for us, um, both for the cooperative cataloging programs and the distribution of records, uh, but it's also going to be important to sync up our MARC and BibFrame cataloging as they exist together. Um, so data import and export are extremely important to us, and we are so grateful for all the hard work that people have done to improve data import within the past year. We're excited to learn more about where that's going to go. Um, unique IDs are also important to us because they're critical to matching up against these different, um, different systems. Yep. Uh, in acquisitions, a couple of the features that, that we, we've identified are the ability to process invoices against previous fiscal years, enhanced functionality around receiving and claiming, um, organizations, orders, and integrations with uh, accounts payable systems, uh, the ab ability to manage donor information within Folio, which is very important to us. You saw all the special collections that we have. Um, the ability to store banking information, our um, folio implementation is going to be the system of record uh, uh, for acquisitions, and also allowing for independent acquisitions units for ordering and receiving. Uh, fulfillment and reader management are also kind of a two fun areas that go together. Um, let's see. Well, maybe I think that... Um, so when new collections arrive at the library, they're added to the inventory and start stored at an offsite location. And the library is currently working towards completing a retrospective inventory uh, um, of the collection on Capitol Hill, uh, which represents more than 200 years of collecting and millions and millions of volumes. It's not yet complete. So that means if a user requests something, the system could show that all copies are in use when in fact, there are uninventoried copies sitting on the shelf. So for this reason, title level requests is very, very important to us. And we're currently working with EBSCO to sort of elaborate exactly how that's going to, to work. There are lots of associated features there. Um, printing paper slips is also important to us. Even though this is a big modernization project, some parts of our workflows are not going to change and we need to be able to continue with paper slips um, at least for the next couple of years. Uh, Reader management and, and user photos are, um, the library currently relies on uh, a homegrown application to um, distribute library cards. And it's very important for us to have photos because the library is actually part of the Capitol complex. Um, the Capitol police that guard the Capitol are also guarding our doors. Uh, and we need a way to identify and validate people's identity when they're in the building. Uh, so right now we're working with EBSCO to define features to support reader, reg reader registration data for library cards, including photos, as well as information about what reading rooms a researcher should have access to. So ultimately, the idea is that a reference librarian should be able to scan a researcher's card and get a screen with their name, picture, and any restrictions or notes about them. And, and this is one of those areas I'm excited to see what other libraries do with it. So... Um, 
Uh, we're so lucky to have a big team here. Um, and there are even more people who were not able to, to come who have contributed to this project. So uh, we're so grateful to have these folks at WolfCon this week. Um, as we wrap up this talk, I want to give you an assignment. Um, find these people and say hi. <laughs> uh, and, you know, maybe give them a little fist bump. <laughs> they're here to talk to you. Uh, they're here to listen to your concerns and maybe even answer some questions. Um, so go forth. Uh, just a couple of closing thoughts. Um, I noticed that in her talk in 2021, Caitlin Saney from Open Infrastructure Foundation talked a little bit about what a phased transition to a more open technology infrastructure might look like. I just want to say that I think this year marks a turning point in that change. <laughs> and I'm not just talking about LC, uh, but of the many libraries around the world who looked at Folio this year and said, yes, this solution, this software is the best choice for our institution. This makes sense for us. And I want to acknowledge that that change is made possible by all the people who are in this room today. Um, some of you have been here since the very beginning. Uh, all of you did the hard work of imagining how this critical software could work differently. Who had the foresight and the perseverance to build that software and the governance structure and the community itself. So you did that hard work to make the solution available to all of us. And I wanna thank you. I hope that we can live by your example and bring that same vision and steadfast, steadfastness to the Folio community. Thanks. Thank you very much, Caitlin. Uh, and we are now moving directly into uh, the Scaling Open Source Software Consortia Large Libraries and Folio uh, panel session, which Caitlin will be participating in as well. If our panelists could uh, take seats here, we are gonna briefly take turns coming up for a quick introduction and um, a quick introduction of yourself and um, a brief intro into Folio in your, your environment. Um, so just to kick start us quickly, uh, let's go straight to Donna Bacon of Mobius. Hello, my name is Donna Bacon. I'm the executive director of the Mobius Consortium. Oh, it actually works. That's a good thing. Uh, Mobius, we're a multi-type consortium based out of Columbia, Missouri, but we also have members in uh, Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas, and Iowa. We have 62 academic libraries sharing uh, an integrated library system. We have 19 standalone library systems. Those are libraries that have their own uh, ILS contract, joining the 62 libraries for resource sharing for a total of 80 member libraries that have a total of 230 libraries. We're multi-type, so we have special academic and public libraries. We offer many services to our members, but our main focus is still a shared ILS system and a resource sharing system. Mobius was formed in 1998 with Missouri State Appropriations to create a shared ILS for the academic libraries in the state and a resource sharing system. Innovative Interfaces was chosen in 1998 and we haven't done an RFP until 2021. We ha currently have seven Sierra clusters or servers uh, that share, that have the 62 academic library systems on them. And InReach was chosen for the resource sharing system. Currently our union catalog has over 12 million deduplicated bibliographic records with about 30 million items and members fulfill about 350,000 items annually. We load over 25 million records annually, including patron items, bibs, eBooks, et cetera. And our libraries on average each save about $46,000 annually by sharing an ILS. However, membership felt it was time due to changes in the ILS marketplace and the purchase of Innovative by Clarivate to do an RFP. So in early 2021, we did an RFI to gather some general information and then in, in 20, later in 2021, we did an RFP for a new shared ILS and a resource sharing system. We chose Folio for our 62 libraries 
And we also chose OpenRS as our next resource sharing system. Why we chose Folio? Because it's a creative and collaborative effort to deliver a new library services platform to transform library technology using agile development and because it's the first new system built in 10 years. It's the most technologically modern, flexible and open platform that's going to set our consortium up for future success as our group continues to grow and evolve. And it's built around apps, making it flexible and easy to add functionality. Because it's open source, it allows for continuous development of features and it's migrating to any other vendor we felt would have been considered a lateral move. The current status of our project, we signed a contract with EBSCO to host Folio in October of 2023. We formed working groups with our member libraries on cataloging, circulation, ERM and acquisitions. And the, we're in the middle of implementation right now to go, go, due to go live in May 22nd of 2024 with 62 libraries sharing, it, sharing an instance of Folio. We're working with EBSCO on the extended consortial support uh, product. And there's a session on this on Wednesday at 3.30 if you want to learn more about the extended support, consortial support. And of course... We went live with Folio because there's an endless number of bee jokes out there. That's really why we went live with Folio. When do bees get married? When they found their honey. And my favorite, where are we exactly? I love bee jokes. <laughs> Thank you. Exactly. And Lucy Harrison from Galileo. Yes, so I did have some slides, but I guess in the interest of time, y'all can just go grab those on your own. Um, so quick introduction, I'm the executive director of Galileo, which is a consortium in Georgia. Um, we have uh, 26 university and college libraries within our Galileo Interconnected Libraries groups. We also have the state archives that we are currently um, managing their ILS as well. So um, those are the core 27 libraries that we will be moving forward with on Folio and OpenRS. Um, so that ranges from, we have four research institutions, we have two law libraries, a medical library, and then that goes all the way down to libraries that literally just have a handful of staff and um, you know, just a, a few hundred students. Um, so that's our Galileo Interconnected Libraries um, service. We have a courier that, we share, um, that they all share as well. We also have our larger Galileo uh, research portal, um, which serves the entire state. So that includes all of the public libraries in the state, for example. That includes all of the technical colleges. It includes um, over 30 private higher ed institutions. It includes all K-12 students in the state. So those folks, we are providing um, databases, e-content, authentication, and discovery services. And we would love to be able to hook into those libraries in ways that we are not currently with our Alma and Primo solution to provide a better resource sharing across some, if not all, of those groups. So like Donna, we also started with an RFI a couple of years ago, and our RFI, RFI was to determine whether there were open source solutions out there that would meet our needs. We have a history in the state of Georgia. The Evergreen software was developed in state by the Public Library Service, and they are, um, their Pines Network is using open source software to this day. Um, so uh, we did this RFI and determined that yes, um, both Evergreen and Folio could potentially meet our needs. So then we embarked um, uh, around this time last year on an RFP, and um, the results of that RFP uh, were EBSCO hosted Folio service, which it won outright on the merits. There was no sort of thumb on the scale because it was open source. There was we didn't you know we didn't really um, give any any extra weight to them because they were open source. It won based on 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 the merits of the proposal that they that they had. Thank you so much. I think you all have a pretty good sense of the Library of Congress at this point, so I'm going to go ahead and pass it on to Terrence. My name is Terrence Ingram. I am from the National Library of Australia. Um, so I'm a little bit jet lagged um, being over here. So um, we, so probably a title probably is probably a good thing to, to mention. So I was going to have slides, but that to be, it's too much effort. So I'm just going to talk. Um, so pretty much 
I'm the project manager on a project we call the Library Management System Replacement Project, which is a bit of a stupid name. It's a bit of a mouthful. I, I, thought, I thought, but I wasn't in charge to, to, to name it. But effectively, for the last 13 months, we've been going on a journey to implement Folio. So my, uh, myself and Elizabeth Bailey, who's the di Director of Collections Management at the National Library, who's around here somewhere in the audience right at the back, we came to WolfCon in 2020, just before the pandemic, you know, back in that era, you know, before a different time, um, to ch check out Folio, check out the vibe, meet the people, and see, is this a thing we could actually invest ourselves into? And the answer was yes. Um, and then it took a while to kind of, like, we're a federal agency, the same deal, procurement, bane of my life. Big effort to get through the whole point and to actually get to actually implementing the real things, which which is what we actually all care about. I actually felt of actually retiring after the procurement process was over. I thought I've achieved the objective, but I, I, we hadn't actually done anything except just chosen the vendor. But but anyway, um, last 13 months, we've been going on the journey of implementing Folio. We went live of, uh, of with Folio on the 31st of July, which is a few weeks ago. So yes, thank you. Um, as we'll talk about APIs coming up, the project for us isn't just wasn't just implementing Folio. We threw out our OPAC. Uh, we were with I don't want to say it. We were we were on Viewfind, <laughs> and we'd forked it back in two thousand and nine, and it was a complete disaster for us. And for that point, we were marooned on our own island of one user. And um, anyway, we we went with Blacklight. Um, but probably the the largest aspect of the project for us was actually integrating it into our environment. I loved you. What, what did you what did you call it? You call it. I wrote it down. The spaghetti monster. Yeah. Well, we have our own diagram, and, and we call it the barnacles because all, because because we have all these barnacles rusted onto onto Voyager. And I think this, the the National Library of Sweden's around somewhere. I've met them as well, and they would they call their diagram the squid, which is a similar kind of thing as well. And essentially, for us, for the last thirteen months, has been not only implementing Folio and learning all those different things about Folio, but also how do you integrate it into our environment so that from day one. You're a functioning business to deliver. You know, we've got 85,000 items that uh, come from our closed stacks into the reading rooms. We have, you know, 70,000 patrons. Uh, you know, our OPAC is small fry compared to yours, but, you know, it's still 5 million users a year. How do you function from day one and not look stupid uh, by moving to something brand new and, and be, again, be shipwrecked on another, uh, an, an, another island of failed RT projects, which is one of the fears that when you start on something really, really large, because it is large and scary. It isn't something you just wake up one day and go, hey, let's just do a new library management system today. You know, it takes a lot of planning and a lot, and a lot of effort. So anyway, that's a long intro. Oh, oh thank you very much. Um, and I'm going to ask uh, each of you a question, um, maybe some other questions uh, or some follow-ups there. Um, I'll start with Donna, if you want to hand the microphone down. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll have time for some uh, some questions from the audience, um, either in person here or online. Um, I'll try to watch chat. Um, and uh, so Donna, uh, talk about resource sharing options that are available for consortia and what Mobius is doing for resource sharing. Okay. Um, we've been doing resource sharing since 1998 when we first started. Um, we pr started as academics, as I said, and then started adding public libraries around 2003. Uh, the academics were very worried about it, uh, adding publics for fear they'd, they'd take all their books. Um, it turned out the other way around. The academics were taking the public library books. Um, so eventually everyone started learning to get, uh, to get along. And now we've just added more and more public, large public libraries to the mix. Also special libraries, the St. Louis Art Museum, Missouri Botanical Garden. And we started expanding out of state to about, about 30 million items in our union catalog. So we've, we've had a long history of patron initiated, um, resource sharing in our consortium. Um, when we did our RFP in 2021, we knew we needed to keep patron-initiated resource sharing, started looking at the marketplace and found it rather lacking um, uh, to find out what we needed. We'd been using InReach for several years, but InReach is on a very old um, software platform, very old architecture. Um, it hadn't been... Um, kept up to date and did not look like it was going to be kept up to date. Um, and so we knew we needed to make a change. Um, and so 
what we were going to change to and keep it patron initiated. Rapido is out there from Ex Libris. Um, didn't quite fit our needs and was rather expensive. Um, you also have um, Autographics, not patron initiated. You have WorldCat, not patron initiated. Um, you have uh, Reshare, not patron initiated. All these are ones that require staff interaction uh, for the uh, patron to get their materials. Um, so these were all a step back backwards for us. And then during our RFP process, EBSCO and Knowledge Integration came to us with a new idea, which eventually became OpenRS, um, and also an open source system, which was very exciting to us and felt like something we could get our hands around and something that was something we could get involved in, something we could get involved in the development, in the governance structure, um, something we could get uh, involved in the feature set, something we could get involved in the community, something where we weren't dealing with a vendor and fighting for features and fighting for um, uh, to get bugs fixed or what the platform was going to be or uh, how it was going to grow, um, how it was going to stay. Um, we felt it wasn't a lateral move. It wasn't something that uh, we had no control over. So we're very excited about the prospects and what they brought to us. Um, so it eventually became known as OpenRS, and we're really excited about it. Um, there's a lot of potential around OpenRS, and there's a session about OpenRS that I'm participating in uh, tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock, I believe, if you want to hear more about OpenRS. But um, I'm hoping that it's something that can help um, expand our consortia and what we can do, uh, connect to other consortia with OpenRS. Um, but I think it's the wave of the future for consortia and resource sharing. Thanks a lot, Donna. Uh, Lucy, uh, could you give us your thoughts on how to build buy-in from consortia libraries and identify requirements that meet everyone's needs? Yes. So I, I mentioned the the the, the um, rather diverse set of, of libraries that we have within the University System of Georgia. And of course, the archives are in there as well. And um, just we mentioned the historic University of Chicago. I just want to mention that the University of Georgia was actually founded in 1795, 1785. I'm sorry. So beating University of Chicago by over 100 years. And then we have, you know, what? <laughs> um, and we also have ones that were that were just literally created in the last you know ten years. So a very very diverse. And um, we also wanted to, we had this idea that we wanted to have something that could potentially serve other other folks outside of the, the the university system as well. We have in the past hosted some of the technical colleges back when we were on Voyager. Um, we have the archives I mentioned. We work very closely with the public library service. So we wanted to you know build in not just requirements for the university system. Them, but also looking a little bit broader to those kind of concentric circles of stakeholders that are outside of our, our core group, but focusing back on just the university system. We, um, a lot of it was, you know, when you're, you were, Caitlin, showing your slide around sort of you know, socializing, a lot of it is more socializing it, sort of getting people used to the idea of we're really seriously considering open source here. We've been with vendors for so, for so long. We have some history of open source um, development within within Galileo. Certainly, we were on Viewpoint for a while. Um, we have our Affordable Learning Georgia program, which is all about open in the sense of open access um, textbooks. But a lot of it was sort of socializing and getting people used to the idea of this is the change and it will be okay. We we can if we make this decision, we can we can go there. So the RFI I would say was a critical part of that. You know, kind of getting people used to the idea that yes, there is this sort of base level of functionality, this minimum viable product that would would meet our needs. Um, and then we moved into the RFP development process. We um, bagged, borrowed, and stealed requirements from everybody that we could get in touch with. Um, we had our own set of requirements from the last time we did this. We revisited those. We put a big group together. We had, um, uh, gosh, over 20 um, functional experts who were providing, who were funneling feedback from their own functional committees. So um, again, kind of concentric circles of of, of influence and, and getting buy-in from everybody. Um, it took 
uh, we took a good three or four months to build those requirements. We ended up with um, almost 400 requirements. Um, and uh, we, uh, you know, we, we, we released that in a very transparent way. We made sure everybody had an opportunity to, you know, talk things through and, and provide feedback into those requirements. Um, and then when they when the results came in, we had a really, you know, when we the answers came in from the respondents, we had a really robust process back and forth, lots of opportunity to people to to focus in on those requirements and and really fine tune them. I will say that things were made um, a lot uh, a lot easier when we saw that. Mobius was going, that Library of Congress was going. You know, we had a lot of cataloging requirements that when we can point to the Library of Congress and say, look, if it's good enough for Library of Congress, <laughs> surely it's going to be good enough for us. We are not actually going live until um, summer of 2025. So that was another way to sort of buy in, you get buy in into this process is to say, look, we have two years for this product to mature from the time that we're making a decision. That's two years for us to have input. It's two years for Mobius to go live, for Library of Congress to go live, for other folks to be implement to be impacting this process. Um, we didn't have, I don't remember how many you said were unique requirements for, for y'all, Caitlin, but we ended up with, I think, about 40 that are sort of things that are not there yet that we need that to be there before we go live. And many of those are already on the Mobius roadmap, already on the Library of Congress roadmap. There's just a handful of things that are sort of unique to us. So it's been a, um, a process and the process is far from over. Again, summer 2025 is when we're going live. So um, things may still arise. Um, things may, may, may change. We may you know, uncover things still that need to be, um, need to be developed. But uh, with the, the decision about OpenRS, I think we are looking um, to, to start involving some of our other stakeholder groups as well in this process now. So moving beyond the kind of the core 26 USG institutions plus the archives, starting to talk with our friends at the Public Library Service with whom we share a courier. Um, we would love to be able to to get them set up on you know, with the, within the OpenRS framework so that we can start sharing materials more broadly. Thank you, Lucy. Uh, Caitlin, uh, can you talk about how the Library of Congress is extending Folio to meet its needs? Yeah, definitely. And actually, you teed me up pretty well with that uh, question about requirements, um, because uh, we, we talked about the complexity and the scale of the Library of Congress, but it might be helpful to give you a little insight into like how we got here. Um, we started doing market research for this as early as, I mean, really, we did some horizon scanning back in 2015, I think, but 2017, 2018, we started inviting peer institutions, inviting vendors in to kind of learn about what was on the horizon for library service platforms in general. Um, we kicked off, we used that experience as a way to kick off a larger, what we call the business needs assessment, essentially stakeholders from around the library sitting down and talking about uh, what their needs were. Um, that resulted in a list of uh, almost a thousand requirements. <laughs> and um, I think that we had to go through that process. I think that it's actually critical to kind of the, some of the federal procurement um, that we did, uh, but it, it did capture, um, I think in some ways uh, it made it difficult to uh, identify those truly, truly mandatory requirements, uh, which in some ways uh, makes it difficult for us to explore um, uh, what is really necessary to support our scale. So um, as we did our solicitation um, last summer, we identified 450 mandatory requirements that were needed to maintain continuity of business. That was the, the yardstick. And uh, to your point about the sh the shipwrecked, um, I don't know what you said. That was like a, a great analogy. It's a shipwrecked island of te failed technology projects. Like the the when you have programs and processes as complex as some of these really big institutions, maintaining continuity of business is a really really tall order. And so I think that that's kind of. Um, uh, it's taken us to an interesting point in terms of where we are now. We're, we're working our way through this requirements analysis with EBSCO, looking at those 450 requirements and mapping them to individual features that already exist in UX prod or where necessary, writing new ones. Um, and that has forced some um, forces to be a little bit leaner 
uh, it's forced us to kind of take a critical lens at some of these processes and say, hey, can we do this differently? Can we do it better? Uh, I've got to give a big shout out to the implementation consultants from EBSCO who have helped us. Uh, I, I can't, I thought I saw them. There we go. There we go. Uh, helped us think through ways that we might be able to leverage existing functionality. Things like tags are coming up a lot uh, to handle some of those workflows. Um, so just wanted to give some context there. Um, it's important to acknowledge that it's still sort of early days in a way for us because we, we're still in this visioning process. Uh, we've not yet gotten into the nitty gritty of our implementation. Um, I think that one of the, the biggest things that we are doing to scale Folio uh, is, was included in the press release when, when we announced our, our selection. Uh, we are going to be enhancing Folio to support BibFrame. We're working with EBSCO to do that. Um, BibFrame is an institutional pr priority for us. It's been in the works for more than 13 years, um, and it, it's really time for it to take the next step. So uh, there's going to be a panel. Matt Miller is here. He's our uh, the developer of our Marva link data editor. Uh, he's going to be on a panel with Gloria Gonzalez on Thursday morning to talk a little bit about BibFrame and how it relates to scale. Uh, internally, um, it's been an interesting process. We, we just held some uh, workshops with EBSCO to try to envision what a, an environment might look like where we're supporting both mark and link data at once. Because again, back to that idea of maintaining continuity of business, if we're also in, introducing this huge change along with all of the, the work that we have to maintain, um, it, that's going to be too much to do at one time. So uh, we do have... Um, uh, we have a goal to implement uh, linked data cataloging, BibFrame cataloging for monographs at Go Live, which in and of itself is huge. Um, but we're not going to be able to scale it out to the rest of the library immediately. So we're starting to look at how Mark and BibFrame might coexist together. Um, so it's interesting to note that while we're doing this work on envisioning BibFrame, how it's going to work, we're also talking about Mark cataloging and how we're going to maintain data that's good enough for the Library of Congress. Like we, we hold ourselves to a very, very high standard in part because we know so many institutions depend on us, right? So many institutions are, are ingesting our data. They have, um, we, we won't just break our internal integrations if we start creating Mark that looks different. <laughs> uh, it'll have cascading effects across an entire bibliographic ecosystem. So uh, we take that very, very seriously. Um, and as we're working through some of the requirements analysis related to Mark and hitting you know, certain sticking points, um, it's been interesting to also kind of watch the bib frame development and think about whether we might be able to address some of the problems that we're having with Mark with some of the bib frame features that are coming down the pike. Uh, and I think specifically right now, something we're, I mean, again, early days, we're just starting to explore it. Uh, is staff search. Um, we call it staff search, folio search. <laughs> um, uh, the creation of metadata is a huge, um, a huge investment for us. It, it's resource intensive. It's one of our core value propositions. And so when we're working at the scale that we do, we pretty much expect to be able to get at all of the data that our catalogers spent time making and um, get at can mean different things, but uh, being able to search on specific marked data elements is important to our stakeholders. Uh, and of course the inventory record uh, is an abstraction layer. Like it's not everything is in the inventory record. That's not what it's supposed to be. And so as we're moving through this requirements analysis, there's a little bit of a tension between, I want to be able to search everything and I want to be able to have this inventory record as a, a way to channel that through. So it's been interesting to start looking at things like Marva, which has a more flexible search infrastructure and might be able to give us access, ironically, to all of the marked data elements, um, and whether that's something that we could potentially implement. So um, we're going to start looking at more of that. And I think that uh, I saw that there's a, a session on discovery, I think, this afternoon. And I, I think that that's going to impact our thinking about discovery as well. Um, yeah, I think I'll, I'll hand over to Terrence. And Terrence, can you talk about working with the Folio APIs versus what you had been doing previously? Um, and 
Uh, with that, your plans to integrate with uh, various local services, including your national repository? It's very interesting, actually, listen to you, Caitlin. I think we like the little cousin of, of you, like in terms of what we do in our business, because everything you talk about, like we sort of interested in. Um, but I think our journey to get to Folio, like a whilst I underplay what we did for the procurement, was a 10-year journey beforehand of multiple white papers, market scans, you know, coming in 2020 and actually meeting everybody and checking out the vibe of, of Folio. But essentially, when I put together the... Um, the, uh, the the tender, I don't think, I don't remember how many requirements I actually had. But one of the things I decided I really needed once we were going to go live was I made sure that into EBSCO, and Mike probably doesn't know this, but I, I made sure that I wrote in the performance output of the API within seconds. Because integrating into our environment is, was the, is the big game. Like I just made the assumption hey, people have gone live with Folio, Cornell made it work, geez, I'm sure we can make it work, even if we sort of can't, but we'll make it work. We will we can write apps. We've got, a, as I described the barnacles that we had on top of Voyager, we've written an, a number of apps. That you had a little thing, you called them helper apps, I think so you call them. So we, we've got a same thing, it's called something different in our universe, but you know, got a whole bunch of apps. And we've got one of them called Mark Grep, by the way, which does every... Um, field within a mark record you can search but it exists outside folio so we use the apis to integrate into that and then we also have like real time all well, our digital content every time a patron looks at particularly in trove you may have heard of trove it's one of our products we've written which is sort of like a version of it's a, um, europeana it's kind of the same kind of thing but essentially every time a, a, a somebody looks at that a digital item it makes a real-time re request to voyager and that has to do that to folio and you don't Nobody wants a slow web page, right? So, I mean, that sort of sucks. So um, having fast APIs is very, very important. So we've integrated with the APIs very, very heavily and into the contract I, I wrote it in so that I could then put the gears onto to EBSCO to say, hey, you need to ramp up the AWS resourcing so that the thing could actually work for us. Um, but what we've done is we use about 25 different API endpoints within OCAPI. We found oh, the OAI, I don't want to be negative, but it, it blew up Folio for us too many times, so we abandoned that. We listened to others that have implemented Folio beforehand, so shout out to all of you. Uh, when we met Tom Kramer three years ago, I think we're sitting at lunch, and I think you used the word, you, you've probably forgotten, um, second generation or third generation implementer. I think that was the line, and I came back and thought, that's the revelation. That's exactly what we're going to be. So, but we then relied on the people with the first generation to actually learn from them. So spoke to Cornell, made friends with Cornell, and they, they said, uh, if you want performance, you need a cache. Write your own cache. So we wrote our own cache. But the cache, the only way we make the cache work is through API calls. And that becomes became really, really important to, to integrate with all the different applications that, that we did. The export to our Australian National Bibliographic Database, again, a long mouthful, the union catalog, which we wrote and maintain as well, but it's a separate application to us, um, is all via OAI. But we were reliant on Folio OAI, but it wasn't fast enough. Just, just didn't work properly. We implemented it on top of our, ca our cache. And that cache is going back every few minutes back to, uh, to, to Folio and refreshing itself. And I think where I found where we found Folio to have shortcomings, the API was the gateway to make it work in, in, in our ecosystem. And as the product matures and it grows, and I'm sure you guys will implement a whole bunch of features, we're going to go, awesome, I'll be crossing out these little ecosystem of helper applications and then plugging them directly into, into, uh, into Folio. Um, and I think the other thing that the API also enabled us to do is to get around functionality that is almost there, but not quite there, but I want the community to build it or I want to contribute to the community. An example is Pixlips. I think you mentioned that, I think. Um, the printing wasn't that great. Um, the way you do it is too hard to manage. There weren't enough, um, what I think they call tokens onto a Pixlip as well. So in other words, our circulation staff couldn't actually function to go to the shelf and grab things off of the multi-sites that we did. So we wrote our own Pixlip printer viewer thingy. Again, all using the APIs. And I call these apps the quick and dirty, kind of like a, a gunslinger kind of thing, shooting from the hip kind of vibe. But again, as Folio matures, we'll just cross lines through all these different things. 
And I think that's the power that we can do with Folio because anything you can do on the UI, you can do via the API. But there's a caveat that comes with the price. Every time you integrate and, you, and we upgrade, we have to a, a robust set of tests um, for every upgrade, which is, you know, that's sort of like the double-edged sword for us with regards to APIs. Did I, I hope I answered your question though. Absolutely, perfectly. And you mentioned Cornell several times, which is- Yeah, important. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, no, I've now I've got one question uh, for each of you. Uh, most of you touched on this a little bit anyway, so maybe we can keep this um, pretty quick. Like, could you name even uh, maybe one or two things that you were hoping you get from Folio that's different than what you had in the past? And maybe start down at Terrence end, or you can you can choose. Sure, I'll, if you I'll, I'll, keep, I'll keep it really short. I think being locked into Voyager for on twenty years. And I actually, the reason I've got my computer is I have some notes to kind of be kind of succinct. But we were screen scraping Web Voyage, right? And doing crazy things like hacking the, I mean, I remember it was I'm a developer and I got excited about hacking the Oracle database, which I think violated our contract with them, but we didn't tell them um, in order to achieve what we wanted to achieve, right? Um, and I think that the thing that mo has most excited us about Folio has been the ability to bring about change and implement things where via APIs integrated into our environment and, and contribute back. We've been developing software in our organization for 20 years, got lots of development teams. It's something we feel we're quite good at. I don't want to talk us up, but we think we're good at it, you know, so you know, don't judge us. But that is something we're excited about and we can contribute back to that. And I think that has been one of the major drivers while we actually chose the product as well. Whereas with every other vendor, and like I've been involved with my regular job is director of technology operations and I deal with lots of vendors right and vendor products and you go into like a voting thing you go to like a annual user group and you say hey search sucks fix search do this and we vote and put little sticky things and nothing changes you know like year after year after year and we didn't want to do that again with probably the most important product that drives our business and what it means is I can come to a place I can ring up people connect with the product council and actually contribute and make a change. And that's, that's why we went with it. Thanks. Um, I should have mentioned this earlier, but uh, you know, we, we have a whole laundry list of very specific things that we're hoping to see in folio in the very near future. And if you're interested, I saw people taking pictures of the, the slides that called out specific functionalities, but if you go to UX prod and you can search on the tag LC, um, and you can see everything. Yeah, thank you. Yep. And there, you can, there's a dashboard. It's like the, there's lots of ways to get at that information. Um, uh, we also have some feature summaries that are maintained by our internal product owners for each of our tracks that I hope to share with the community, maybe through the implementers page. I don't, I don't know where the best place to put that is. Um, uh, but this is all to say um, we have very concrete and public uh, expectations for Folio in the near future. Um, but when I think about the future of Folio, I think that um, what I'm most excited about is seeing some of those features in production. We, we've spent a lot of time talking about what needs to happen and sorting out you know, the must-haves from the nice-to-haves. Um, but we learn so much from having software in production. You just there's you, There's no substitute for letting that functionality out into the wild and finding out uh, what you actually need. <laughs> um, so I, I'm excited about that. And I'm excited to see what happens when our stakeholders at LC start using the software. Uh, but perhaps even more than that, I'm excited to see what people in the community do with these features. Um, uh, we benefit so much from having a diverse community here, a device, diverse community of libraries, a diverse community of vendors. And I think the more eyes that we have on the software, the, the better it's going to be. So um, I'm excited to see what happens when some of that BibFrame functionality is released to the public and see what people do with it. I'm excited to see what people do with the Reader Manager app. I'm excited to see what where a lot of this goes. Pick slips, the you know the lowliest things I, I think could could surprise us. So um, uh, yeah, that's what's what I, I think about when I think about the future of Folio. 
So I've already mentioned the resource sharing, which is not strictly folio, but I, I, I hope will be very closely integrated into our, our folio solution by the time we go live. APIs, also very excited about increased access to APIs and um, in the sense that um, your APIs have been around for a while, but sort of we don't have to pay extra for them. We don't get limited in how we can use them. We are not restricted in how we can use them in the ways that we have been um, in, in, the, in, the, in the past. Um, also very, very excited about BibFrame link data being sort of you know, baked in from, from the beginning and what opportunities uh, Folio might give us to reimagine our workflows locally in ways that I think we were hoping to do with our last migration uh, 10 years ago, but maybe didn't quite get all the way there. So so now perhaps we can make that, that leap. And then the last thing I'll mention, um, which was not a factor again in our actual RFP, but the fact that it's open source and the fact that we can get engaged with the development of the product, um, not all of our libraries are going to, but, but really take ownership and start building some of our local expertise in-house in ways that we have not not, um, have not been able to with our with our current proprietary vendors. I think everything that everyone's already said <laughs> and summarize it in one word and that folio equals empowerment to me. Um, it empowers it empowers us to do all of these things that everyone has said. So it's it's one word to me, empowerment in so many different ways that I, I, I couldn't list anything more than what they've said empowerment that sounds perfect thank you um we have um about eight minutes until eleven twenty when this group adjourns um are there any questions uh from the audience here um i'm keeping an eye on chat online as well and there aren't any there yet so uh any hands up for questions online. I don't really need the mic, but the online people can't hear me otherwise. What has been the biggest challenge that you faced so far in your implementations at whatever stage you are in your implementation? What's been the biggest challenge? He doesn't want to hear from me because he works for me. <laughs> Yeah. Again, we're two years out, so um, mostly our challenges so far have been, you know, procurement and legal challenges, <laughs> not challenges, but you kind of getting through the, those hurdles. And I would say, um, you know, it's just getting everything set up and getting everybody socialized to get started. I am sure we will be experiencing more challenges um, as we actually get embarked on our implementation. I feel that, um, but also I think that uh, we kind of heard it, the, the idea of what's good enough for the Library of Congress and maintaining continuity of business have been sort of um, uh, maybe a sticking point for us um, as we reach for like total perfection at implementation. Um, I think we're starting to realize that that we need to, like I said before, be a little bit leaner and maybe define acceptance criteria for, for what acceptable change might look like, acceptable difference. And um, that's a, a kind of shift in thinking that we're having right now that I think is going to kind of impact the next implementation. I think before we went live, the biggest thing I feared was integrating with uh, applications um, and being I've been involved in the National Library of Australia for many years and I've actually written many of the applications. So I kind of knew some of the shortcomings of some of the apps, but that didn't turn out to be the largest challenge. Um, I knew data migration would be a challenge. Um, and I, one of the enterprise architects came to me one day and he pulled me aside like six months of the project. And he said, Terence, you know, when we migrated to Voyager, and I was like, dude, I wasn't around then, but you were obviously early in your career then. And he said, oh, the whole project was delayed due to data issues, right? So. I was really worried about data migration and it actually turned out to be not as bad as I thought, except for one area. And I think the area that we undercooked, if I could just talk about the largest challenge was orders, was orders. Now, maybe not, maybe most people don't care about that, but we care about that. Um, and migrating orders and doing multiple rounds with loans and orders and getting all that working properly, we ran out of time. We spent all our time in inventory and did three rounds of inventory and it was great. Yeah, it was a great experience. Yeah, thanks to Anya and the team. I enjoyed it. 
but orders, I think we're a little bit undercooked now. I think it turned out to be a bit of a challenge, particularly once we went live, because we had a few issues there. All right, thanks. Uh, and I saw a hand up here. Uh, this is a wonderful panel. Thank you so much. Uh, Lucy, you mentioned uh, priority would be uh, developing your staff's capacity and your skills, experience. And Donna, you had the great empowerment. Can you, all four of you, maybe talk about how you balance working on yourselves, working in the community, or working through a commercial partner? Where do you put your time and how successful have you been on developing on all three fronts? So, I mean, ours are sort of theoretical at, at this point, but we've got a, you know, a small, um, you know, internal team that actually works for, for Galileo, who will be, you know, transitioning basically all of their time, um, as much time as they can spare. We do have a system that we need to keep running for the next two years as well. So, um, but most of their time is going to be transitioning over to um, doing the implementation. Um, we are going to be, so I've been a member of the um, Folio Consortia SIG, right? I, I dropped off while we did the RFP, but I've, I've been participating in the Folio Consortia SIG for um, several years prior to that. And, and we will be encouraging our folks to to get involved you know with with those with the um with the folio sigs as well um but you know we are ebsco supported folio so our focus and uh, during the implementation is going to be on sort of getting to our minimal viable product with the support of ebsco and working directly with them to to get the product to, to where we need it to be once we get sort of you know towards the end, the last few months of our implementation and our go live date. And then I think we're going to start looking to the future and, and what's next for us. And that's where I think the really exciting stuff is going to start happening. Um, you know, our path for the next couple of years is pretty well mapped out and it's mostly going to be going live. Once we get beyond that, then I think we'll be looking to make some changes in, in you know, how our staff are, are, are prioritizing their time. This is a boring response, but ours is similar. Um, uh, you heard me say that that we have direct congressional oversight on this project, and it's really important for us to kind of meet our our uh, commitments to Congress. We're under a pretty ambitious uh, timeline. Um, we have to have all of the features that we outlined as mandatory for our initial implementation in production uh, by June of 2025. And, uh, additionally, we have an expectation that we need to go live with acquisitions at the beginning of the fiscal year. Um, so that means that, uh, at a minimum acquisitions needs to go into production in, um, 2024 and maybe a lot more than that. Oh, sorry, October, 2024. Um, you also heard me refer to like that, the idea that we've been building our team up, um, the, it, Sometimes federal hiring takes a while, and and it it has taken us a while to to reach full capacity, and so it has taken everything that we have had, and even um, borrowing people from sister divisions, from from you know, kind of uh, leveraging our stakeholders and asking for a little bit more of their time to get through this initial process of requirements analysis and determining exactly what it is we need to see in in production by that time. So. Um, like Lucy, I think that we're kind of in an all hands on deck mode right now, but I do, I mean, like I said, I hope that this is the beginning of a, a greater participation in the community. And I think that that's something that we will scale over time and certainly focus on after our initial go live. When we came in 2020, I think uh, as an organization, we were really keen to self host and WolfCon 2020 destroyed that for me. And I came away saying, one of the biggest recommendations is wait, which we did. And second of all, we're not self-hosting. So that's why we ended up with a hosted solution with EBSCO. And that was the best decision decision we made. You know, depending how EBSCO go, Mike and team, you know, who knows in three years' time when the contract's up, we'll see what happens then. But uh, essentially, so that was that side. And we treated Folio then as a black box. Like, imagine it's a vendor product and they need to get it up and running. In terms of, we then focused on the staff. So I polled... We visited like uh, your institution, we visited Cornell and various others and said, hey, when you ran your pro your project, I mean, obviously we're smaller than you guys, so let's just put you as an anomaly on the side, but smaller. And I said, like, how did you run your project? You know, and how many BAs did you have? How many developers did you have? How, how, what is your staff engagement? How many teams? So 
we sort of listened to what everybody did and some of the ideas and then sort of looked at our institution and put together a rough team of subject matter experts. But, you know, it, it was a project that involved maybe 20% of the organization, about 60 staff, members, 50 to 60 staff, you know, 14 tech, tech people. And then it became about delivering the product, working with EBSCO and getting it done and going live. Community involvement was way down, except if it was a bug or, or if, like I needed to learn something. But we've always had the aspirations to be more involved. We want to contribute, contribute code. But this is the, the, the but for the, probably the, something for the people to think about. It's an organization or a, a project that is more North American focused in terms of time zones. We live on the ass end of the world compared to everybody else. It's not convenient. The meeting, none of the meetings are convenient. None of the SIGs are convenient. So for many of the things we said, look, as much as we want to get involved, like 2 a.m. is just not going to cut it for us on a regular basis. Um, and let's just focus on getting a working product. Because as a software developer, a working product is your only currency. And, and I realized as project manager, that was what was going to get me across the line. And so my intention now at moving forward is more engagement with the community, getting more involved, building features, enhancing it for us as well as for the community as well. But we had to let that not really spend a lot of time on that because at the end of the day, when I reported to my project board and they said, how's the project going? If I said to them, oh, you know, we've got all these problems with this stuff, but hey, community engagement with the Folio community is like amazing. We're doing so well there. They wouldn't have been that excited. Um, and they would be more excited on actually the thing working. So I think that's, we had to then lean towards, lean into that. I think Donna's gonna get our last words in here. Huh. We have, um four staff who are working plus me working together as a group uh, managing the folio project and we also formed working groups with our membership who volunteered there's like eight to 12 people on each working group circulation cataloging erm acquisitions and open rs so we meet with them every week so we have meetings every single day with either the working groups or we're meeting with EBSCO because we're EBSCO hosted. So we still have to manage our Sierra inReach platform while we're migrating, of course. And we're also attending SIG groups as we can um, while we're also doing all the work, all the implementation work. So we're pretty busy. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Donna, Lucy, Caitlin, and Terrence. Um, let's give them all a big round of applause.